Welcome to Conversations with TEDx Yangon. TEDx Yangon conversation ma jozo bare shin. Di ne si sin le ya ro English ba da ne pyo ma phit de atwe chao English lo we sa pyo kwin pe ba shin. Um, this morning's program is going to be in English and I would like to welcome everyone who has chosen to spend either your Saturday night if you are tuning in from the United States or your uh, Sunday morning with us. So I just want to start with a little bit of background about TEDx Yangon for those of you who are not familiar with us. We are a volunteer run organization. We are affiliated with uh, the TED conferences and we operate under license from TED. TED itself is a not-for-profit and we at TEDx Yangon are completely volunteer run, not-for-profit, supported by a lot of people who give us their time, their expertise, and also in our bigger events, uh, we also benefit from sponsors. And I'd like to thank everyone who's been involved in our journey so far. And if you've already tuned into TEDx Yangon Conversations, uh, you might have caught a few of the speakers that we've had in the past. And I'd like to recount some of those um, because this special one, the last one of our first series uh, is uh, going to conclude um, this initial series that we, we ran. And the idea to run this all really came out of COVID. We couldn't do our normal programming where we might meet individuals one-on-one um, -on -one or uh, gather together as an event. So we decided to go online uh, and decided that this is actually a great opportunity to have longer form conversations with uh, individuals because usually, as you might know, TED and TEDx talk, talks are short. In fact, the platform insists that the talks are no longer than, than 18 minutes and we have to work months on months, uh, four, five, six months at a time with speakers in order to crystallize their ideas into those um, 18 minutes. So um, we've been liberated in a sense from that. We have had an opportunity to dig deep into um, individuals, their experiences and their ideas. And I just wanna recount um, the, the people that we have uh, invited into this TEDx Yangon Conversation series, the, the first series over the last um, six months or so. Uh, every month on Sunday, every first Sunday of the month we've run this, uh, we had one special one. So we've had um, six individuals so far. Um, that's historian, Dr. Thamye Wu, MMA fighter, Alang Sang, reporter and TV host from Australia, Alison Langdon, NASA's flight surgeon, um, Dr. Stephen Gilmore, environmental scientist, Dr. Thay Wen Aung, and education entrepreneur, Wu Aung Che Kin. Today, before I introduce our guests, I just wanna give a special thank you and a shout out to people who are joining through the American Center Yangon or the Jefferson Center Mandalay pages. The U.S. Embassy has kindly um, offered to collaborate with us to open this conversation up to their incredible network of uh, followers and uh, people who join American um, embassies, uh, great programming through the American Center and Jefferson Center. So hello and welcome to all of you. Sorry, I think I had a little technical glitch. So thank you again. I also want to thank our TEDx Yangon team, always volunteering. Uh, we have uh, our members of the core team volunteering to mend the questions and answers that you will give later on. So please type them into either the TEDx Yangon chat box, or if you're viewing from American Center or Jefferson Center's pages, we have individuals from those organizations volunteering to take those questions as well. So thank you to those. And of course, thank you of course, of course to the team at Selwyn Group uh, who help us produce this pro bono, and we really can't do this without you. So, now for the main event. We are so delighted today that we have uh, Mimi Ao, who is the project manager of the Mars Helicopter Project. Hello, Ma Mimi, how are you? Hi, hello. I'm doing well, nice to be here. <laughs> Very good to have you here. So Mamimi is dialing in from uh, the US, uh, from California, where the Jet Propulsion Laboratory is based. Uh, and thank you so much for 
taking time out of your Friday night. I'm sure after a very long uh, working week, uh, sorry, Saturday, Saturday, sorry, my time's mixed up. Uh, Saturday evening, uh, even worse, I think, uh, rather than resting your weekend to uh, spend uh, these uh, one, two hours with us. So thank you again. Uh, Mamimi, I think uh, some people will know you very, very well. Uh, others might not. So maybe I'll just do a short intro, but really want to hear from you on, on your background. Um, you lead the Mars Helicopter Project, and we're really going to spend the next uh, hour or so talking about the project itself because it is novel. It is something that has never happened before. Uh, the fact that we're going to have a, a, a vehicle um, flying uh, in uh, an atmosphere that is outside of our own atmosphere. It's going to go to Mars. That's that's incredible. I know there's been uh, it's been a feat of engineering, years and years of work uh, from your team, and I'm sure a lot of teams. Uh, coming before you as well. So we'll, we'll spend a lot of time doing that. But given that um, the audience that uh, we have today is mainly from Myanmar, uh, what used to be Burma, and you, uh, you have a, a, a Myanmar background, uh, you spent uh, part of your childhood here, uh, I understand from when you were two years old to uh, around about 11, uh, and your your parents um, are your parents are Myanmar. Uh, they're actually professors. Uh, I understand your mother is uh, a professor of mathematics. Your father uh, is a, a food scientist, and you grew up in this academic family. We actually uh, have some photos uh, from uh, from your childhood. I believe if our producer Frank can uh, can show those. Um, we can uh, we we can take a look at young young Mimi who oh can we freeze on the the one with the the prize um, you you're taking you have you you're receiving a prize at school uh, and uh, that's oops, they're all flipping sorry we've been having some technical difficulties this morning uh, so apologies that these photos are uh, flicking through so so quickly but. Um, there are some people joining from Yangon, and they'll be familiar with the school that you went to. It's TTC, was it? Yes, I went to school in TTC. And uh, like you said, I was uh, in Burma, you know, Myanmar, 2 to 11 years old. So those were my formative years. Um, that's where I started my education. Education is something I just always have valued and always loved. So my education started there and that picture when you asked me for pictures that picture was very important to me um that was my uh, first grade uh, i was receiving the you know the first place uh, you know the, there was a medal that was given and so i thought i would share that no, that's fantastic. I think a lot of us are familiar with pictures like that here. Uh, and of course, getting first place is a big deal. Um, uh, one to 10, uh, there are prizes given, but of course, number one, two, three, get the special prizes. So uh, obviously you were a good student um, since uh, since you were very young. Um, tell well, us also- I have, to tell you, I have to tell you one thing that happened. Uh, my grandmother, Papa uh, challenged me. <laughs> so she said, if you can get first, I'll give you a prize. So <laughs> my grandmother gets the credit <laughs> for, for me working very, so hard for that. My first very grade. good. No, uh, it's an academic family. And I know because we actually uh, um, went out to uh, try to get Mimi's time uh, through NASA. But then once we got connected and I was mentioning that, you know, we, we, we are speaking to you, one of my relatives said, oh, you know that you're related. So our grandmothers are sisters. Uh, and yeah. uh, knowing how my grandmother was with uh, education as well, I, I can understand where, where they come from. So our grandmothers come from Mogo. Uh, so if people are dialing in from Shan State, Mogo, uh, that's, that's sort of uh, half of our, our family through Mandalay. So uh, great. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely something that's quite inspiring. Um, your mother, let's spend just a little bit of time about your mom because you know she's uh, a professor of mathematics and you mentioned that you, your love for mathematics sort of comes from, from her uh, and uh, a lot of my relatives rather speak very fondly of her. Uh, so uh, can we talk about sort of that influence? Sure. Uh, since I was young, uh, I, I was lucky enough to have 
you know, at, at home. Uh, my mother, who is very uh, technical, she's, you know, mathematics, very logic oriented. And my father, uh, food science, which is really chemistry, you know, it's a branch of chemistry. So I grew up in a very technical family. And specifically, my mother, uh, I, I love math uh, from young, and I really uh, did get it from her. And uh, I think uh, from young, you know, just the way she's logical, she, she loves math and, you know, she's very uh, systematic about things. I think that helped. I was getting groomed probably subconsciously uh, just being that way. Uh, and I have a, a, a fun story about uh, my mother's always, you know, soft-spoken and uh, very gentle. And there was just one time she snapped at me and that was, uh, we were working, I, I was asking her uh, for help on some math, uh, you know, concept, new concept. And I was impatient and I said, okay, okay, you know, I got it. Uh, just, just tell me the answer. And she stopped me. She says, never. You say, you never asked me for a shortcut in math. And, uh, you know, that's the kind of lesson, you know, I was like, you know, firsthand learning and I never forgot because I was so surprised that she was like very direct and very, you know, strict. <laughs> so, yes, uh, but I, I learned a lot and, and, and really all of my um, career and, and even education, you know, as you go from the foundational education and you get to higher and higher level education, um, I really uh, build upon, you know, being systematic. You know, it really, it just like in the math, you know, all the equations, the numbers, the addition, subtractions, multiplications all add up to higher level math and algebra and, you know, calculus and, you know, building on. Um, I really uh, took education and then later applying education uh, in, you know, in engineering and applying to making systems work. I really believe in having the foundation and building up systematically on it. So. I definitely have followed her path, uh, her, her um, footsteps. And it's actually her footsteps that also led you out of Myanmar uh, to the U.S., I understand. Was she doing her, her doctorate in, in, was it the U.S. that she was doing her doctorate? Yes. So she got her Ph.D. in mathematics uh, from uh, University of Illinois. And um, in fact, I was uh, born well, while my parents were both doing their PhDs. Uh, and then after they received their PhDs, that's when, you know, we went back to uh, Myanmar and that's where I, you know, grew up. So, yes, absolutely. She, she was a PhD in uh, mathematics. I mean, that's incredible, right? At that, at that time for a woman to have a, a PhD uh, and uh, coming out of uh, Myanmar, although Myanmar, I think, was a little bit more advanced back then than maybe the last uh, few decades. But we hope to catch up uh, and we hope to have a lot more people coming out of good tertiary education again. Um, so le let's let's jump to that. Let's talk about your your own uh, university and uh, career, your bachelor's and, and master's, you know, what did you study? How did you kind of get into that? Yes. Yeah, so um, as uh, in, uh, you know, starting with the elementary school, you know, in Myanmar, and then uh, I, we spent a few years in uh, Malaysia from 11 to 16, you know, I, I, I was learning more and more. And as I had, uh, you know, you grow up and you, you have more advanced uh, education. I, I definitely love math. Uh, as time went on, uh, I just, uh, to me, it's just so logical. Everything clicks together. You know, the answers build on top, uh, uh, one over the other. So uh, it, when I was 16, um, we, you know, I went uh, back to the to United States and uh, finished my senior year in high school. Then time came uh, to pick a major uh, in college. And uh, again, I wanted to actually major in math. And my dad and my mom, parents both said, you should major in something uh, that you're going to make an application on. You know, so instead of pure math, uh, think about a field with application. And so that's what led me to um, study engineering, as opposed to if you left me alone, I think I would have followed my mom's footsteps, pure math. <laughs> so anyhow, so I uh, picked uh, engineering uh, as an undergraduate. In, uh, in fact, I went back to University of Illinois, where my parents uh, you know, got their PhDs, actually the campus where I was born. And, uh, and then in engineering, I had to decide you know, which kind of engineering, because there's so many varieties of engineering. So there um, I picked electrical engineering 
And then once under electrical engineering, again, there are so many fields, even within electrical engineering. And out of that, I ended up uh, really falling in love with signal processing and communications. So that's about you know signals uh, that when you transmit the signals, right? And it goes through the medium, either atmosphere or any atmosphere or any medium that you're transmitting to, that's gonna degrade the signal. It's gonna corrupt the signals, right? So uh, mathematically, how do you recover on the other end? So there's a transmitting end and there's a receiving end, right? How do you recover the signals that you've transmitted far away or you know through the corruption? And so there, is all math. You know, you, it's like you design the sig signature of the signal to the way you know it. And then after it's gone through the, uh, you know, distances and the degradations and the noise that's added to it, at the end, how do you recover it? By again, mathematically processing it so that you can process out the noise that has been added on and all the degradations, you know, try to amplify back and do the filtering of it. Um, so the whole love for math and then wanting to make a system work, to me, that's where it converged. And so uh, that's, I got my master, uh, bachelor's degree in uh, you know, general electrical engineering, but my favorite classes were in signal processing and communications. And then after that, I uh, did a master's degree also in electrical engineering, and I did my thesis in signal processing. And right from after your master's, is that when you ended up joining the, the JPL? Yes. So when I received uh, my mass, uh, master's degree, you know, it's time to apply for jobs. And uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory is one of the centers of NASA uh, that does space exploration. And so, in fact, one of the professors uh, on in my, the university um, said, hey, you know, you should think about the deep space network, uh, you know, that is a part of the deep space exploration, where it's a network that's receiving these signals, you know, with very large antennas, right? Like, uh, some of them are 70 meter diameters, others are 34 meter diameters, very large antennas, and really receiving these tiny, tiny, tiny signals. Okay, from spacecraft far out, like in the outer planets, right? Jupiter, Saturn, even further out, right? We have spacecraft that have left the solar system, right? Mm -hmm. So really getting the signals coming from the spacecraft so far away, and you can imagine these are very weak signals coming across space, right? De getting degraded purely from the distance period, and then coming back and even at Earth, going through the atmosphere, getting further degraded, and then here we are on the ground with very large antenna, getting to recover the signal, right? Getting rid of the noise and you know, amplifying it uh, with very low noise amplifiers, amplifications uh, that add very little noise to it, amplify as much as possible, and then go back to the signal processing to recover the signals that were sent from so far away. And um, so anyway, uh, with, with that uh, interest, uh, you know, about deep space communication triggered, um, I interviewed with the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL, and I, I still remember my um, interview day there. It, it was it was a dream come true <laughs> because everything that I studied, right, from a kid, I, I was talk as a child talking, right. We've been talking about since young and all the incrementally building up the education, and then at the end, really falling in love with signal processing and communications. And then now here I was talking to the people who were building these communication systems to communicate with spacecraft so far in deep space. And um, so uh, needless to say, uh, after I uh, came to interview at uh, NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL, um, I, I, you know, I just fell in love with the place. And at that time, uh, JPL was building the very first digital receiver. So before that, they were using analog receivers, you know, using analog components like capacitors and inductors, resistors, and, you know, I mean, just more analog components. But this is in the 1990, 
you know, it was time for the receivers to become digital, right? So where you start to use the uh, digital processing and digital signal processing. So it was a perfect time uh, when I arrived at uh, JPL, I got to join this group that was building this receiver called the Block 5 receiver. Uh, and it was the very first digital receiver for the Deep Space Network. And so I spent my first uh, six, seven years, starting from the very beginning, because they were just starting to you know, design from scratch and then following it all the way to implementation. And that receiver, Block 5 receiver, is working in the Deep Space Network still today. It's still tracking those signals uh, from the spacecraft out there. So that's how I started at uh, JPL. It must have been incredible to be there when your know, technology is shifting upon your recommendation after our, our pre-call to prepare for this. I actually watched that um, movie Hidden Figures uh, oh. and, you know, where the IBM machine was coming in to replace all the human calculators and all the human calculators were women. Uh, and in this particular case, African-American women at that. Uh, and that was a fantastic movie. So thank you for recommending. And um, those of you listening who might not have have seen it, Hidden Figures is an excellent movie. And I really also got an appreciation for just that mathematics, you know, needing to work things out with that, the rigor of mathematics. Um, not that that's something that uh, is, you know, uh, what I do, but um, I could, I, I really like, you know, what you said about that. You, you can solve things with mathematics because it will, the math is there. It's either right, right or it's not right. Uh, and then the math will prove it. So I, I love that um, element of it. So you, you've been with JPL for 30 odd years. So obviously you like what you do uh, and um, you're leading this uh, Mars helicopter project. So let, let's spend you know, a bit of time on, on this helicopter. And then I think we'll, we'll come back and talk about your career and uh, along the way, what it really takes to be successful at a career because we have a lot of young people tuning in as well. So you know, to, to just give people uh, an idea of what we're talking about, can we have a picture, a, a photo of the, the Mars helicopter? You know, when we say Mars helicopter, we're not talking about the kind of helicopters that you might see flying around uh, and Earth, uh, you know, um, transporting people. This is the Mars helicopter. So Mamimi, uh, can, you, can you tell us, you know, what we're looking at? Sure, so this is the picture of the Mars helicopter, which is named Ingenuity. Uh, that's right now, as we speak, on its way traveling to Mars uh, on board the Perseverance rover, okay? So uh, what you're looking at is the uh, heli uh, Mars helicopter on the very top, the flat panel on top is a solar panel. It's a solar powered uh, rotorcraft, okay? That collects the solar energy, the panel on top, okay? Then under the panel, uh, and there's a, it's very hard to see, there's a little gold spiral coming out of the solar panel. That's a little antenna that the helicopter will communicate uh, to receive its commands and also to transfer data back to its base station, uh, which will uh, stay on the rover, Perseverance rover. So this helicopter is a standalone uh, little helicopter that will operate on its own and it will receive uh, commands from its base station that's on the rover and it will send data back to his base station on the rover. The rover will relay the data back to us on Earth, and then we'll send the commands to the helicopter, uh, to the rover, and which will relay it to the base station. And the base station will talk through that little goal antenna. Oh, can we stay in that uh, previous figure, please? Okay, so then under that solar panel, you see these two pairs of blades, okay? They are the rotor system, and they're blades that are going to rotate, counter-rotate, and they're going to spin about 2,400 revolutions per minute, okay? Because the atmosphere at Mars is very, very thin, okay? It's like 1% compared to the atmospheric density in the room that you're, we're all in, you're in, I'm in, right? That air is very thin, the atmosphere is very thin at Mars. So these blades have to spin very, very fast. And you see how big they are compared to the size of the helicopter? So to lift something so uh, in an atmosphere that is so thin, the blades have to be as big as possible compared to the body that you have, and you have to spin very fast, okay? So these blades that you see are tip to tip from one end to the other is 1.2 meter in diameter, right? That's about four feet in diameter. 
and the and then under the two uh, counter rotating blades, you see the shiny cube. That's what's called a fuselage. Okay, it's a fuselage. It's shiny because the outside is a thermal skin. It's a special skin that's designed uh, to, with a special uh, metals, like four layers of metal deposited, uh, to make sure that it can emit heat. And it can also absorb, you, you know, some some sun. So absorptivity and emissivity is carefully balanced, and it's a special skin that goes around the electronics that are inside. So inside is uh, in the middle are batteries that the solar panel from the top charging uh, gather garner the solar energy, and it stores the energy in the batteries inside. And then the batteries are connected to a set of custom circuits around it. And that these uh, the small circuits, the boards have spe special computers uh, that actually are making, letting the helicopter operate autonomously. So these computers do many things. First of all, uh, it, the helicopter, again, it's going to be staying on Mars in the configuration that you see. You know, it, it goes to, uh, to the uh, Mars on the rover and it gets the rover, Perseverance rover will deploy it to the surface. And once it's deployed in this configuration that you're looking at, this little helicopter will have to live on its own. Okay, and Mars get very, very cold at night. So first of all, the very first thing, this helicopter has to survive on its own at like minus 90 degrees Celsius, okay? So the computers have, are looking at the temperature sensors and it's got heaters that are coming on and off to first of all, keep the helicopter warm, warm enough. Second, the computer also uh, received the commands that we sent over to it, and it, it, it breaks down the commands and will autonomously fly this uh, it's, itself uh, with the commands that we give. So these computers have to like autonomously fly the helicopter, fly, come back, take some pictures, land, and send the telemetry back. Right, so the computer has to uh, keep uh, keep the helicopter warm at night. It has to uh, be able to fly the helicopter, be able to land safely, able to send the telemetry back, um, and then the cubes uh, around the cube. Uh, there are also four legs. You see the landing gear. So that's the other part of the helicopter. So anyway, this is a rotorcraft, and the entire helicopter is about half a meter up from the bottom, from the feet all the way to the solar panel. And so uh, this is a little helicopter uh, that is going to demonstrate the first, it's gonna, we're gonna, this is called a technology demonstration uh, uh, mission because it's the first time that we're demonstrating uh, flying a helicopter uh, in, uh, at, at Mars. In fact, it's the first flight outside of anywhere. Human beings have never flown on another planet and this will be the first other, you know, first flight. So this is called a technology demonstration flight. And this ingenuity will be attempting the first ever flight on another planet. And that's quite risky, right? Uh, how do projects like this get approved? You know, when did this get approved? You've been working on it for seven, eight years now. Uh, can we can we understand how sort of these incredible endeavors actually get taken on? Because we're still talking about budgets, we're still talking about pe pe people who have uh, particular objectives that they're trying to achieve. You're, you're actually having to send this along with the, the Mars mission, the Mars rover. Uh, how do you work together? How many people are involved? All of that. Sure, sure, okay. So first of all, uh, the, the need, you know, the motivation for wanting to fly on another planet. Um, today we explore Mars with spacecraft orbiting the planet, and we have rovers that are driving on the surface, right? So, so the 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 orbiters let you look at the entire planet, and you can take images, but the images are you know fuzzier. Like they they're getting better. They're getting better than a meter in resolution, but it's still fuzzy. Okay. Then you have the rovers on the surface that can take very high definition images, right? Like centimeter level image. You can see things very clearly, but rovers can only see what you can see, right? Uh, beyond, if there are ridges or terrain that's blocking, you can't see far beyond. So you can see that adding that aerial dimension, the ability to fly complementary to the rovers on the surface and spacecraft in orbit would really enhance the way we can explore the surface of Mars, go to places that rovers can get to, like very steep cliffs um, and, um, you know, sites of cliffs. And so that we really want to fly. In addition, when the human being, humans get there, you know, the astronauts get there, 
we will uh, want humans will want to scout ahead of you know traverses by even, even being able to fly and taking high definition images. So we definitely want to add the high de uh, high definition images and at the aerial dimension to scout ahead of rover, scout ahead of astronaut scout, you know, like reconnaissance to look far ahead before we traverse. And we also want to get to places that we simply can't get to today. Oh, so what you're seeing here is the helicopter, uh, which is once the rover, the rover is taking us, Perseverance rover is getting us there, is carrying us. Once Perseverance gently drops the helicopter to the surface, Perseverance will drive away to at least 100 meters away. And here is heli Mars Helicopter Ingenuity. It will start doing autonomous flight demonstrations. And this is what uh, will look like. These are the. This is uh, very similar to test flights that we've done in our chamber. You see the solar panel on top. That's the part that. Uh, these are the kinds of flight experiments that we'll be performing. So. Anyway, the motivation is to add that aerial dimension. We don't fly, you know, we don't use the atmosphere today. So how we started, um, about eight years ago, our former uh, director of JPL, Dr. Charles Alachi, posed the question, and he, as from the director, he, he was on a, a lab tour with us, and he said, why aren't we flying at Mars? And so at that point, uh, this was in the 2012 uh, timeframe, uh, then we said, okay, well, in the 1990s, We've had researchers at JPL, like uh, Dr. Bob Balram, who's our chief engineer, you know, that had shown that it's possible to lift at Mars in the 90s. Similarly, in uh, NASA Ames, you know, like Dr. Larry Young, and there are a few other places, there were research in the 90s that showed that there is enough atmosphere, it's really, really thin atmosphere, but there is enough atmosphere for us to be able to lift and fly. But the trick has been, because the atmosphere is so thin, you have to spin the blades very fast. The blades have to be as big as possible. The entire vehicle has to be very light. And oh, that's one parameter I didn't mention just now, the 1.2 meter diameter helicopter that we have built and that we're, we're, you know, that's on the way to Mars. The entire vehicle, the mass is 1.8 kilograms. That's about four pounds, right? Because that's how light it has to be. Even though it's spinning 2,400 revolutions per minute, the entire vehicle still has to be very, very light so that it can lift, right? And so the entire, uh, so the reason I'm mentioning that is back in the 90s when it was shown mathematically and physics wise that it is possible to fly, the technology wasn't ready for us to build an autonomous helicopter that can fly on its own, that can land on its own, that can keep itself warm, that can communicate, you know, to, to a base station to pack all of those capabilities into a 1.8 kilogram kind of mass just wasn't available. But fast forward to this 2012 when our director, Dr. Alachi, asked the question. Um, we connected Dr. Bob Bellram back up with Dr. Alachi, and um, we, there was initial uh, research we initiated to say, perhaps this is the right time. And then initial research showed that it was the right time, possibly, but we still started as maybe and the question definitely was there it's like really you know there was a large part of the community that really was saying because it was so counterintuitive we really faced the question of feasibility are you are you are you guys you know sure like or, you know is it really possible i mean is this really a sensible thing you know so it was very counterintuitive so that's where we started and so we took one step at a time okay so the first is uh the at jpl the research and development investment to say all right let's just show lift and so and that's about the time i joined about 2014 uh, when we did a little third scale vehicle, I think we'll be going through the, uh, we'll go through the videos in a second. So we did it in little steps. First, we showed the lift, then we showed the ability to fly. And then we had to answer the question of, can you really build a copy that can be sent and operate at Mars? And so starting from a place of where you're questioned <laughs> pretty severely, right? Like, really like you know you guys are you sure about this to really getting to where we are today um you really have to take one step at a time you know so again this all comes back to the math uh where the 
you know, the the, the com CFD analysis, computational fluid, you know, uh, dynamics analysis, you know, the, the analysis shows that you can generate the lift, but there is the analysis, right? But then you convert that analysis to, okay, you can lift, how do you control it? How fast do you have to read, you know, estimate the state of the vehicle? How fast do you have to control the blades? And how fast, you know, does the entire computer and the mechanical systems and the software and all the parts, how well do they have to work together? It becomes a story of math and physics, right? All working into now the different disciplines like mechanical engineering, the structure, right? The computers, the flight software, right? FPGAs, uh, the actual materials, right? The telecommunications, there is uh, guidance, navigation and control, sensors like cameras on board and gyros, accelerometers, right? Altimeters and how do you read the sensors? And then there's the whole uh, thermal engineering, right? How do you make sure there's power engineering? How do you get the power? How do you get the power? How do you store it? How do you have enough energy to stay warm at night and still have enough energy to fly during the day? And the whole, you know, materials and processes. And then there's the whole field of how do you test it? Um, how do you, you know, we don't, we get to Mars ultimately, but again, incrementally, we have to show that our algorithms can be turned into things that are built together in different disciplines. And then all that have to be integrated together to work as designed. So um, because it was extraordinarily challenging, it really was at the cusp of feasibility. Um, our team became even like, even more tight than you know traditionally traditionally space projects are difficult right because it's you can't go and repair it right it has to work right so in general spacecraft have to be very high reliability and they're challenging we're doing things for the first time uh when we send a new kind of mission well this one is definitely uh in that class of uh, first of its kind mission and our team is uh, extremely tight as i mentioned from every dimension of uh, engineering that you can imagine we really had to put our heads together uh, whenever there was a shortfall in one discipline or one area, we really had to work as a team to make up, you know, in another discipline or through a system design. So all the various disciplines that you talked about, um, that means a lot of specialists, right? There are people specializing on the, the signal side, the, the battery, the, uh, the actual computing, the mechanical which means a lot of coordination, uh, especially as you said, you can't get this wrong. Once it's up there, you can't fix it if th something goes wrong. So I assume there's a lot of people that you as a project manager have to coordinate, people within the project team needing to work together. Uh, I assume also that these are incredibly talented, incredibly smart people who sometimes have egos. You know, how, how do you make that teamwork and collaboration work and also because you know you, you're not just working within the jpl you're you're working across other nasa teams you're also working with external contractors who are pro providing you with uh, components how does that all work well uh definitely keep the big picture and in this case this is it has never been done before and so i think um it, it was uh we had to be unified and i remember one of our first you know few team meetings and i remember sharing with the team saying hey this is really difficult okay but again starting from these uh, the math and the physics based equations and the simulations uh we know that it is possible to do this okay so theoretically uh none of us had any question that this was doable OK, it, because we're in the team. And then uh, I remember saying that, look, guys, well, I guess, you know, we as a team, this is really exciting. And one thing that bonded us together, it was clear, is that how often in your lifetime do you get a chance to go for something, you know, this complex and it's never been done before? This is a chance, a chance of our lifetime. And so I remember our mind melding kind of where we connected where, hey, guys, you know, we are all together in this. Uh, this is definitely a chance of a lifetime. This is so difficult, but we know the equations that we're trying to make happen through all of these disciplines. And we really, uh, you know, I think one of the statements I made is 
every one of us has to be a systems engineer, you know, that looks across the impact of everything each of us do, how it impacts the whole system and how it ties together. And each of us have to excel in our own individual discipline. We have to be both. And the other thing is uh, that each of us have to be our best because it is so difficult, right? And we have to implement the whole, make the whole system work together. And to be frank, each of us actually has a license, whether we want to or not, uh, the, the, the license to actually break it <laughs> because we're doing all of this for the first time. And so I, we had that as a team, that thought uh, from the very beginning and that's a culture that I valued. That's something that I instilled uh, in my role as the project lead, project manager from day one, really emphasizing on the big picture. You know, so now you talk just now about, hey, what about if they're egos? You know, what are about difference in opinions? Um, because the task is so difficult, really, uh, there was, you know, there wasn't room for like, um, so many unnecessary uh, disagreements <laughs> because when we were stuck, we were stuck because it was so hard to do, you know. Uh, and we had to so we had to put our heads together. So uh, my, I guess one of the major roles, or I guess one of the contributions uh, that I took very seriously, is to make sure that we talk through all of the bumps that we met. Um, you know, just certain things, it's like we were stuck, you know, we were stuck in terms of making it light enough or having enough energy or, you know, the, these different places. How do we test every place is where we had to really, really think through to get past bumps, uh, really coordinating and talking purely technical discussions. And so, you know, rather than having, I want to do it this way because I prefer that way, uh, not going that way, but really thinking about what are we technically stuck on? Is it the mass? Are we too heavy or we're out to not enough energy or we don't have enough controllability or we don't have enough efficiency in a motor or, or we don't have enough in, you know, uh, whatever, you know, solar cell efficiency. What is it? What is it that we can improve and how can we meet this challenge? So uh, that's been my approach uh, from day one. And it has paid off because there are, and we can talk about it a little bit later. I mean, there were definitely very difficult, you know, steps that we had to overcome. Um, the beauty of that is, uh, as we went by uh, years, you know, we are all together for uh, years. Uh, I mean, some people got married on the job. Some people had their first kids on the job, you know, that kind of stuff. But the nice thing is, as we got towards the end, whenever we ran into, you know, these challenges or surprises, it was just amazing how quickly we were able to uh, just work things out because we didn't have walls. Uh, we are, our, our group had to be, you know, just totally frank uh, all the time because it was just so difficult. So I remember one of the cases where something went unexpected um, and, and it, you know, something broke and uh, just, we go, oh my gosh, you know, this happened. And somebody said, okay, this is what took place. And next thing we observe this, and this is a symptom, and this is the failure that we have. And it was an amazing, I think somebody that was sitting next to me says, wait, did you say you were assuming this? You know, I was assuming you did that. And I said it to this. And it's because I did this, that it broke. And because we were just so transparent like that, right? We were able to get to it and we were recovering. And within a few weeks, we were back on track and moving, you know, as opposed to if you're kind of not, you're worried about, should I not say it? Should I be more sure before I even think, you know, this is what happened. Uh, we, we didn't have any of that up. We, we are really, really tight. So it's, it's been one of the most rewarding, you know, uh, experiences in that way. Oh, that's incredible. It's probably like fighting in the trenches, right? You're going to be bonded for life uh, out of this experience. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, let, let's let's look at those videos because you were mentioning you know you had to prove it sort of step uh, by step. Can it actually have lift in in this kind of atmosphere? Can it actually then do uh, a bit of maneuvering? Uh, so I think you, we have a series of uh, little videos of that test that you did in a simulated environment. Um, and uh, if you can talk us through you know what we're actually looking at, that would be great. Oh. So I'm um, so actually, Frank. Can we show oh, the think, other yeah. little? 
the hopping, Frank, the little sequence, hopping one part. Yeah, the sequence is, uh, let's see, what was that sequence? Sorry about that. You can try just one of the other two if you want. I'll tell you if it's the right one. Yeah, I think. Um, there we go. This is the one. Okay. That, that's the first one. Okay. Yeah. 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 So this is the very first one. This is our one third scale vehicle. And somebody was outside joysticking this in a chamber. So we're at uh, JPL, the 25 foot uh, um, uh, diameter chamber. This is about seven, between seven and eight tour. And we're trying to control this helicopter. <laughs> and uh, you can see there, uh, this video is very important. Yes, it broke, but it is very important because this is the first time that we built this one third scale. And you see that we show that you can generate lift when you go fast enough. When you spin at the predicted revolutions per minute, this vehicle started lifting. And you can see that it left the ground effects, right? So it wasn't just because you know, you're pushing this thin air and it's getting pushed up, it's getting very high up. And then the reason it's not uh, you know, staying up is it turns out a human being is too slow in terms of sensing the way the vehicle is tilting and then you know being able to quickly you know uh, control the blades to uh, keep steady so this was a very important demo and this really convinced our um, sponsors and our management and our community that you know it is absolutely possible to lift a helicopter Again, this is in a chamber. You see nobody's in it because the atmospheric density there is about 1% compared to the you know, room outside. And so this is being controlled from the outside. Okay, so after that, ha that uh, we show the lift, um, we said, okay, uh, before we go to this, just for a pause, a little bit of a storytelling here. Um, we said, we definitely have shown you we've, we have lift, but you see how it went up? And then it went off to the side. We weren't able to control it from the outside. And we said, that's because a human being is too slow to be able to sense where the vehicle is going and then, you know, to joystick it from the outside. So if we have an onboard sensor, okay, camera or cameras, gyro, accelerometer, just like you have on your uh, mobile phone, right? If you have those kinds of sensors that are really measuring real time, and that's estimating, you know, if the vehicle is tilting or going off to the side, and if you're able to quickly adjust these blades, okay, the, there's uh, there's called um, uh, cyclic and collective. There are two parameters that you can control on these blades. If you are controlling those back in real time based on what you mentioned, you'll be able to fly it, okay, in an autonomous way, and humans can be in the loop. So our, uh, at this point, uh, we went, uh, this is when uh, JPL, our Dr. Alachi took us, you know, to NASA headquarters. We presented the lift demo and NASA basically came back with a question and says, okay, you've shown us that lift is there. We'll, know, we'll stop asking if the lift, you know, really can be generated in such thin atmosphere. You've done it. Show us that you, it is actually possible to fly in a controlled manner. So at that point, NASA funded us to build a prototype. And so with that permission, what we did was the first vehicle we built is what we call the risk reduction vehicle. And now we don't do a little one third scale anymore. We built a full 1.2 meter diameter rotor system. And we put on there the gyro accelerometer, and then we have a camera uh, based system. And then what you're gonna see in the video is we didn't have, it was so fast, right? We weren't funded to build a whole lightweight computers and batteries and all of that. So we said, okay, we'll let the rotor system fly, but we will keep the computer and the power way underneath, under the chamber, outside the chamber. And we'll have this lightweight tether that is real time, reading all the you know sensor information down and the computer is crunching and commanding these uh, blades at hundreds of times per second. And this is how we said, we will demonstrate to you that you will, we can fly in a controlled manner if there is a computer in the loop. And so that's what the next video is. So fast forward, uh, January of 2000. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. The previous video, Frank. Uh, the first one that you played, video, Frank. Yeah. First one, Frank. This, uh, no, no not, uh, not that one. The, that that one. one, yes, there we go. Here it is. So this was in May of 2016. 
Here is our rotor system prototype vehicle back in that 25 foot chamber, okay? At this point, you see the rotor system is spinning up full speed to 2,600 revolutions per minute. This is now fully autonomous, okay? We've just told the computer, let the, uh, spin the rotors 2,600 rev, uh, RPM, and then it's flying autonomously based on all the onboard sensors. You see that how it's kind of buffeting a little bit side to side because the air, what little air there is hitting the wall and coming back to hit it, but the, the little helicopter is just staying dead centered, okay? And it was told to hover like that for 30 seconds and then land on its own. So what you're seeing here is a fully autonomous flight in a chamber that has between seven and eight tor. I mean, this is like 1% of the Earth's atmospheric density. There is, it looks very easy because it's working, um, but all the controls of the blades, you know, the collective and the cyclic of these blade systems, it's working um, hundreds of times per second. And this was the first flight. And this, was an, this is an extraordinarily important flight because it's, it, it's historic in its own way because until this flight test, human beings have never flown even in a chamber, right? In, in, uh, in such thin atmosphere. And at this point, this really confirmed that the mathematics and the physics, the aerodynamic modeling that we've done in terms of the lift, and the drag of the blades and the dynamic of the vehicle, how it moves, right? And when you're spinning these blades, how does the vehicle react? All that is mathematically modeled. And then we put, we had designed, how do you sense where it is? How do you command it? And we had simulated all of it in a computer. And we, this absolutely confirmed that our algorithms and our modeling are correct. And you really can fly a helicopter. So this was really historic and extremely important for our team. And uh, at once this happened, remember in the beginning, a lot of people were saying, maybe the non-believers in the beginning, really? Like, are you sure? Like, you really think you can fly at Mars? There was no longer any more doubt uh, after this flight. And we had support from 100% of the community that it is possible to fly at Mars. That's incredible. So, and we do have the third video, but I'm going to uh, let you, Mamimi, tell uh, Frank when we cue that one. Sure. So what happened after that last flight is, okay, everybody says, okay, you've shown you can live and you've shown that you can, it is possible to fly a, uh, it, a vehicle in a controlled manner, not just hopping around Mars. You really can be flying where you want to go and be able to control it. So the third question became, all right, well, but is it possible, can you guys really build this vehicle that really has to be 1.8 kilogram? That's really light, right? And now this vehicle can have a computer underneath. It has to carry everything that needs to make this helicopter work, right? The, all the things that I described about computers and batteries and antennas and solar panels and landing gear and all of that, everything that has to lift, can you build it under 1.8 kilogram? Uh, and of course, it has to be built in such a way that it has to be accom um, accommodatable. I don't know if that's an English word, but you can, you know, that it can fit onto the Perseverance rover in a way. Um, and it can be, you know, make the survive the launch from Earth. And then, of course, you know, then the rover will land on Mars and then in a way such that the rover, Perseverance can, rover can deploy it and survive all of that and operate as a helicopter. Can you guys really build that? So that's the last step challenge. And so at that point, we built what's called the engineering development model, EDM, engineering development model. And that uh, was the, the, the third leg of the journey. And so we really came up with the design and that's where the challenges were, where we came and says, okay, the solar panel has to be that big. Okay, that's gonna give us so much energy that you can get per day. And then we had surprises like, oh my gosh, it takes so much more energy to stay warm at night. When we actually did the budget, it's like, oh no, okay, we have to make the solar panel bigger and the battery a little bit bigger. But guess what? When you make things bigger, things are heavier, right? So that kind of challenges we had to overcome again, with interdisciplinary, this wasn't like one disciplinary discipline solving the problem. It's like thermal needs more energy. That means 
power, you know, motor efficiency so that we use less energy, um, special thermal skins, you know, special mechanical structure. I mean, everybody really had to come together and we came up with a design that closed. And that when we took that uh, engineering development model and put it on the scale, I still remember my team uh, texting me. Uh, it wasn't at the where they were texting. They're like, yeah, we came in just a hair under 1.8 kilograms. And that was one of my most memorable texts that I ever received. And so we were able to meet this 1.8 kilogram. And so the next uh, vi video that you see, and now we can play Frank, we go back to the same chamber. This is a space simulator chamber. But this time you see, oh, uh, you see the vehicle, okay? It's flying completely on its own. Okay, so the, it's powered by the battery that's carrying all the computers that it's on board. And the cables that you see underneath, they are not doing any part of the flight. What it is, is just to service the helicopter between test flights. Okay, and then on top too, you see a tether. Again, it's not uh, helping in the flying. All that is, is taking out the difference, uh, uh, difference between Earth gravity and Mars gravity. It's called a gravity offload so that the vehicle feels like it's flying under Mars gravity, which is only about 40% of Earth's gravity. So apart from the gravity offload on top and the service loop underneath, uh, just purely for servicing, here is a pure autonomous flight of our engineering development model. And, you know, I mean, it looks really easy because it's working, but again, uh, those blades are working hundreds, hundreds of times per second, right? And, and it's using all the sensors on board, it's using the battery, it's using the circuit board, and this was an extremely important flight for us. Uh, and we did many, many of those. We've repeated, you know, many tens of these flights. And once we did that, then NASA, um, gave us the biggest reward that we could ask for. Uh, they gave us the authorization to build a copy, what we call flight model. And that's a copy that is built very carefully, you know, for launch to Mars. And uh, we work very closely with the rover team uh, and huge kudos to the Perseverance rover team. Uh, we, the helicopter was added on later and they came up with a very clever scheme to hold the helicopter underneath the, you know, under the rover, like the bottom of the rover. Uh, they are carrying us under their sideways, uh, being held by an arm, uh, and then that's motorized. And then when we get to Mars, they're going to turn the motor 90 degrees so that the helicopter looks like the picture you saw, and they're gonna drop us, drive away. They're accommodating our base station, the one that we're gonna communicate through, and we'll be you know, working uh, very closely with the rover team to perform these experiments. So the last version called the flight model, and that's what's, that's the ingenuity vehicle, uh, we got to build that. So for our team, that was uh, one of our big rewards. Uh, we built it and then we repeated. Um, we did a lot of the characterization tests and engineering development model, right? Like many tens of flights. And then on the flight model, we test very carefully, very select tests to make sure the design is correct. And then we uh, accommodate to the rover. Uh, and, and Frank, uh, if we could show that picture with the rover, with the helicopter underneath, it's one of my favorite pictures ever of this project. And there it is. So what you're looking at is the Perseverance rover and it's belly pin, the bottom. And you see the gold color uh, bottom, and you see our two pairs of blades, uh, you're, and you see the solar panel. You're seeing it because the helicopter is sideways. You're looking at it from top down. You're looking at the solar panel, the blades underneath, and behind the blade is that shiny fuselage. And the four legs are actually pulled back and are being held by that rover's Mars Helicopter Delivery System. It's called MHDS, Mars Helicopter Delivery System that's holding the helicopter. It's holding also the legs like sprawled uh, so that it would be as flat as possible under the rover. And to me, this was another, um, our team, you know, felt ultimate reward because now we're on the rover, which means we are that much closer. Here we are starting from the very beginning, right? 2012, 13, 14. Is it really possible to fly to? Can you really build it? Sure. Are you sure? You know, a lot of people really questioning whether it's possible to now. Here we are. We've built the flight model and here we are integrated onto the rover. That's one of my one of my favorite, favorite pictures. <laughs> anyway, so 
with that, uh, we got launched uh, on the rover uh, in July of this year. And uh, we're riding on top of the rover at this time. The rover, Perseverance rover, will land on the surface of Mars uh, on February 18th, I believe, around there, February 18th of 2021. And uh, within, you know, a few months, like between uh, two, about two months after that, they will be deployed to the surface. And then we will have uh, 30 days uh, given to us, 30 Martian days to do our flight experiments. So we'll be... As you can see from this story, you know, um, we've come a long ways. Uh, we no longer, there is no longer a question of if or whether it's possible to fly at Mars. So our team has been able to from, again, starting from the math equation, the physics, to physical engineering, right, to turn it into a real vehicle. And again, engineering to architect, how do you build a system that you can operate at Mars to now to really now test, right? We've been inventing innovation and then now to test the other way, operate and every step, you know, checking and confirming. And then very importantly, learning how to operate something that flies so far away at Mars. So we know how to operate spacecraft very far you know, away and we know how to operate rovers, but you know, how to operate a whole helicopter is a whole new uh, way of doing things. So uh, I think now you know the whole story. Um, we've come a long way, we're very proud of it, but the journey is not over. And every step will be nail biting because every step really is a first of a kind. And we will learn, you know, every step that passes, big check mark. If something fails, we will learn. We need to learn because we've tested everything we can on Earth, right? In the simulated environment, uh, we've tested our flights, we've shaken it on our shake tables, we've cycled the temperature wise, you know, we've done everything we can to simulate space uh, here on Earth. And it's really now to like test each step and really learn from it. So please cheer with us and, uh, you know, celebrate with us when we pass milestones. And if we get stuck, you know, uh, cheer us on and uh, we definitely, uh, are, are very exciting days ahead of us. Absolutely. I and mean, we actually have a whole slew of questions coming in, but I still want to show uh, everybody, you know, how how uh, things got developed. So maybe as we're going through a series of photos, uh, Frank, of the, the um, people in sort of what looks to be hazmat suits uh, with uh, with the rover and Mamimi Liu looking at some um, oh. some some of it uh, as well. I, I thought I would yeah. also ask a few of the questions that are coming through um, uh, and just to rest, rest, reassure everybody that we will try to get to a lot of the questions later on as well. Um, there, there was a question, there are a number of technical questions and we've, we have given everybody a link to the Mars helicopter page uh, so that you can look at the basic technical questions. There was a question though, why is it called a helicopter and not a drone? <laughs> uh, yes, I feel very strongly about this one. <laughs> um, the reason is, um, you know, with the story that uh, I've been sharing right from the beginning, you, when that little one third scale hop happened, it was supposed to be a flight. Remember, we were going to joystick it and fly it, right? And the very lesson we learned from there is the dynamics in this thin atmosphere, right? With these Reynolds number, you know, and the Mach numbers that are specific to this very thin atmosphere of Mars. We learned there that the dynamics are very different at Mars. And because of that, even the way we design the blade, you know, this is where we work with uh, NASA Ames, NASA Langley, you know, doing the CFD analysis and optimizing the shape of the blade, you know, the, 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 the way that it's curved, the way it's twisted, they're all carefully designed so that we can maximize lift. And once we had the lift and the drag of the blade, so each blade was cut, it cut analytically into about 32 or 33 pieces. And lift and the drag of each of these pieces was modeled and then integrated back these 32, 33 pieces so that when you spin this blade around, right, the integrated lift and the drag was modeled. And then once you had that was modeled, then we can say when you spin it, the vehicle will react this way. Taking that reaction, we designed how the sensors, how fast the sensors have to be and how fast the control has to be. And then we simulated in our simulation models how to sample 
the, the sensors and how to send the command and how is the vehicle going to fly. So if you think about it, we had to go all the way back to the physics, fundamental physics of how this was going to be designed and how do you build it? Because once we have a design, we said, okay, vehicle had to be, blades have to be so stiff, it had to be strong, but it has to be really light. And the controls, closed loop controls guys are saying, well, we want it stiff because we want to be able to model it really well. Well, the P mechanical engineers who are building it for real, right? Not just equations say, hey, you can only get this stiff. You know, this is, it is long and there is a little bit of floppiness to it. And so how do you compromise, you know, if we can get as stiff as what the controls folks want? Or, you know, what materials can we use? We can use certain materials, but not allowed to use other materials. You know, all these practical um, implementation that had to come together. And so, and then we, I've told a little bit about the story about, you know, how do you build the solar panel? How do you size it? How do you size the battery? How do you run the software? You know, and everything is integrated. We can't have a computer for every function like we normally do on a spacecraft uh, because it has to be so light, we had to share all the functions. So given all of that, I really, you know, uh, we are inspired by more like the Wrights brother uh, moment uh, to do this because it really was going back to the fundamentals. And when we attempt that first flight and to succeed, you know, it really is the first time we're making it work. And that's the reason I want to stick to the word helicopter because to me, a drone is uh, you can go to a store or you can order right uh, online and you can learn very quickly. You don't have to do all the CFD analysis of your blade and how you're going to shape it and how fast you have to spin it and how do you have to design from the fundamental. So what I would like to say is I would like to call this Mars Helicopter Ingenuity. And the reason we're doing this is because we want to add the aerial dimension. And when future, you know, it becomes a norm every time, you know, whenever we go to Mars, we take a helicopter with us. When the humans get there, they take these little helicopters with them to, you know, do surveillance, reconnaissance, all of them. And it becomes a norm. Let's call it Mars drone then. But for now, <laughs> it's a helicopter because we had to learn from the fundamentals. <laughs> Oh, fantastic. And that word ingenuity, uh, that is actually a name given by a high school student. And you did a uh, you did a competition on that essays. And I love that as well, because, you know, here you are sitting at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, really the, the apex of science, but this becomes something that everybody can own. Uh, at, so it's uh, is this something that NASA um, does regularly you know, to, you know, involve the community? Community involved sort of the normal people and especially students. How wonderful is that? Yes. So the Mars Outreach uh, Office, you know, NASA headquarters and at JPL, the Mars uh, NASA Outreach uh, Office uh, ran a naming competition for Perseverance uh, for Rover, for Mars 2020 Rover. It didn't have a name then. And so nationwide competition um, and you know, oh, Sarah is not online uh, speaking with us. Uh, but anyway, uh, I don't remember the number, but it was an incredibly large number of uh, responses, you know, essays uh, that were submitted uh, with names. And Perseverance was chosen for the rover. Um, but another essay that uh, NASA and the, you know, at the JPL Mars Outreach Office, the selection team really also resonated uh, with was an essay uh, by a student, uh, uh, Vanessa uh, Rupani, and uh, she had written an essay about ingenuity that NASA really resonated with. And so uh, from that, NASA picked the name Ingenuity and so that perseverance and ingenuity would go together. And uh, we're delighted because, you know, it, it, it takes ingenuity, but from the story that I've been, you know, sharing throughout the, our conversation here, uh, perseverance. I, I really, this is my fundamental belief, you know, you, you have ingenuity that's needed, but to get to the real thing, perseverance is absolutely necessary. So it couldn't be more perfect. 
Absolutely. And and Frank, can we show that picture of um, the whole project team holding the, the little helicopter? I thought that was also really nice. You know, it warmed my heart because everybody looks so happy uh, hold, holding this project that you've been working on. Uh, there you are in the middle, I believe, in, in red. Uh, and it just it just shows you the number of people involved. It, it, tell us about this moment. Oh, so yes. Uh, in fact, uh, this is not even everybody that was involved, right? A lot of uh, folks at JPL, a few people from AeroVironment, you know, the company that worked very closely with us. But I think NASA Ames and Langley uh, folks weren't here. And anyway, so but this is a big part of it. And this we were taking a team picture. So next to me, uh, you see uh, Dr. Bob Bellram, uh, the one going like this in the blue shirt. He's the the innovator that I mentioned, the one that did research in the 90s, and he, you know, continue on as a chief engineer through to today. Um, we have, uh, oh, there's Havard Grip. Um, oh, I don't have a cursor that I can point to. Anyway, on the very right side, who control the flight design. Anyway, I guess what I can say is um, everyone in this picture um, really had to contribute uh, in their own way. In fact, we also have manage, uh, you know, upper management uh, managers here in the pictures. In fact, somebody from NASA headquarters, our manager, the one next to me on my left, uh, is uh, Dave Levery uh, from NASA headquarters too. And uh, so there's management, you know, higher upper management, NASA headquarters, JPL team, JPL management, JPL, uh, different organization all here. And what I can say is everyone in this uh, picture really had to think critically to make this happen. And it's really hard to explain, you know, you, you know, you've done a job, I mean, for I don't know, anywhere from five years to 10 years to 30 years to some other people in this picture have been there 40 years, you know, but this was so difficult. And everybody really understood what this helicopter simulation was, how it had to work together. And everything that we did, well, how how small to how large, you know, certain things are really big because you can see it, big structures and big moments, you know, where we had to push the button to very small moments. Maybe one person on here is building um, a test stand, right? Maybe a test stand that can have resonance because if it starts shaking, you know, the helicopter can start resonating with it and the whole thing can break apart. There are moments where they are individually thinking through every single moment that can go wrong or how carefully designed it, our design works to the big test that we came together. If you talk to each of those people, they will have extraordinary stories to tell you. Um, and I can't tell you how close we are. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I know all of these people, uh, I mean, by name, uh, they know, you know, we know each other by name. It looks like a large number of people. And not only do we know by name, we know what each person did and, you know, how we depend on each person's you know individual decisions as well as team wide decisions that we've had to make so this is also one of my very favorite pictures <laughs> it's, it's really that's fun. incredible uh our time time is getting away from us and we have so many questions uh but a lot of it really has to do with a uh, sort of motivation for others who might want to do what you're doing now uh and uh, but, but first of all i also want to say that a lot of messages coming in just people saying how proud they are of you and how inspired uh, they are with what, what you have done and have are doing. So uh, we definitely wanted to convey that. Um, but you know, just just so many, so many questions, I'm just going to just generally kind of just talk about, you know, uh, how, how, how do you drive yourself uh, and to get into the career that you have? You know, there are questions about, do you need to study a particular major? You know, did, were you a 4.0 student? Uh, all of that. So maybe we can just talk a little bit about sort of what drives you and, you know, uh, and yes, you are surrounded by, I'm sure, incredibly talented and incredibly, um, you know, uh, accomplished people who, who had great uh, education. So just in general, yourself and your colleagues, you know, what, what do you have in common that people can um, can draw from and uh, follow in your footsteps off? Yeah, um, very important, I think, to realize is um, I really, especially after having gone through, you know, something like the Mars helicopter, which I really, you know, we all, all of us found ourselves pushing even beyond all these years before that we thought we were pushing. 
But one thing I learned is there is no one most special discipline or one most special talent or one most special person. I really believe each person has something really special to give. Okay, so it doesn't have to be like, um, most eye-opening would be, you know, let's say if you're thinking about engineering and you say, oh, I don't know if I can be an engineer because I really don't like math, you know, um, or something. And it doesn't work like that because to make something work, it takes, as I've been telling, the math side. It takes mechanical side. It takes physics side. It takes software side. It takes material side. Uh, it takes the creativity. Um, it takes even the design. It takes the art of putting things together. Um, and I think the underlying thing is that each of us has a, an area that we are just drawn to and we are good at. Um, and you have to pay attention to what that is. Okay. And, and uh, for me, it happened to be math. Okay. But okay, here's my secret. Um, I was not a straight A student. I did. I didn't do very well in chemistry, and um, I have to apologize to my father, who is a PhD in chemistry, food science. But I did not do well in chemistry. Um, I and yet I became an engineer. Uh, basically, then I followed the path, you know, that that uh, that leaned on math. But you may have something else you're good in, chemistry or. Uh, not even that maybe you want to do computer science and you want to write a language you know that actually makes a robot work or you know so anyway the, the first thing to say is i don't think you should underestimate um what you know what you're good at and uh don't think that you know what you're good at maybe isn't valuable because it simply isn't because you can see from a mars helicopter right i mean materials that i mentioned for example uh Oh, and even in spacecraft, it matters, right? I mean, there, there are special materials that we have to use and material science is as far away as you can get from you know, math uh, and things like that. So uh, really, I think you really uh, have to know that the most important thing is what do you like? What do you like to do? And then what are you good at, okay? And really start studying that. And then when you study that, and for me, it took a long time. I mean, I just like math. I went to, you know, do engineering, but still it wasn't until my junior year that I really found the signal processing and communications class, you know, the same time I was taking probabilities and statistics and they all clicked together. And it wasn't until then I'm like, wow, I really like it. And now that I like it, what can I do? you know, uh, by being good at it, uh, you know, I want to work hard. That's the other ingredient. Once you figure out what it is you really have, you, there is no uh, shortcut around working really, really hard. And so that's why you really have to love what you do. Okay, so for me, it was signal processing. Once you put your head into it, then you start to look for projects or companies or organizations or uh, purpose that drives you. What is it that you want to make happen? Uh, and so find that intersection of what you're good at, what you like to do, and where it is needed. And it's like a Venn diagram. So the intersection in the middle, when you find this spot, you just add really, really hard work to it. <laughs> and you'll be able to, you know, get to make things happen that you really want to make happen. So um, I think for me, you know, that's been very true to myself kind of really looking at what i want to see happen and then and you get it you know once you see it it's one of those things you can't sleep it off you can't you know try to forget it it just keeps bugging you don't ignore those signals and i think once you're in that you know you asked just now about drive i think the drive comes automatically after that because once you really believe in that cause whether it's an organization or for me, it's, I love to make systems, complex systems work, especially if it's never been done before. But that happens to be what draws me. But whatever draws, you know, the, the, anybody, you know, I think once you find that, uh, I think the drive comes from that. I think if you, if you ignore it, I, yeah, you know, that, that you shouldn't, <laughs> you shouldn't. And you That's shouldn't get discouraged. Answer.
Yeah, you shouldn't get and discouraged. What, you know? what I'm getting from you know what you're saying is find your own you know find find what is actually uh, something that you like doing, you're good at. Uh, that Venn diagram, uh, the, the description is great. You know, there are a lot of questions coming in about how you know uh, parents can help motivate children, uh, and uh, I, I I'm you know I, I'm a mother of three uh, three boys, and one of the uh, talks you know from the the, from the ted uh, stage that i like a lot is um it's by a lady named angela lee duckworth said you know it's what takes um what what it takes to be successful it's actually not brains it's actually you know not uh, a lot of the other things but she called it grit uh, and I think mm -hmm. that's that perseverance, hard work. Um, when I was at business school, one of the talks that I, I really liked was a, um, a very successful business person, you know, very bright. Uh, and he said, look, there's one thing, there's no substitute for hard work. You have yeah. to work hard uh, to, to get to, to where, where you want to get to. Um, so it completely resonate uh, with uh, the things that I, I believe in as well. So thank you for that. There are questions though about uh, family. Um, people asking, you know, do you have a family? Do you have children? Do you want your children to do what you're doing? Uh, and and I think you know we also talked about you know, the fact that if uh, you are a, a, a working parent, uh, there is a bit of a balance between you know having uh, a family that you know understands and supportive. Uh, can can we hear from you on that as well? Sure. Yes, uh, I have a, a family. I have a husband and two children, two teenage teenage children, and um, you know. It is, uh, it does take hard, uh, hard work. I think grit, I like that word grit. It takes grit, it takes commitment. Um, and it is, it is hard. It is hard. I mean, the story that I just told you about the last seven years or so, um, the amount of work was extraordinary. I mean, there were many weekends, uh, a good part of a few years. Uh, we didn't have, you know, good weekends we gave up many many weekends and and uh there were times that i lost i i did lose out time uh with my uh family um and you have to you know learn to balance so i think it's important that uh you explain to your family um and and i think you know let them understand that it's important to you um and the reason you're doing it why you're excited and i believe that you do need support from the family um Having said that, uh, you know, you have to also make an effort uh, to balance. So, you know, yes, they're very high intensity time where you have to work really hard. And then whenever, you know, you get time off, you know, you make up the time with your family. Uh, and I, I won't, I, I can't just uh, be light about it, I guess. Uh, yeah, I have to be brutally honest. Uh, it is difficult and you have to, be very careful, uh, especially, I guess, if you're a woman, as a mother, uh, you don't want to lose touch, right, with the children. So for me, I prioritize in, you know, being really knowing uh, in their head, you know, where are they emotionally, how are they doing, uh, and then physically, you know, the time that I can spend, I try to maximize as much as possible. Um, and, you know, you have, Somehow we do have a lot of capacity, so have confidence in yourself, uh, you know, get a family that supports you. And sometimes it can look daunting, but you'll find a way, uh, but it, it's not easy. And, and just to tell you that there is room to stretch when you have to, uh, for example, because in the middle of all of this, for example, my mother actually got ill, terminally ill. Um, and so, uh, in fact, she came, you know, and lived with us. Uh, uh, and you know, all until um, you know she she passed away. Very sad and very uh, big part of my life. And again, that was also absorbed me as a now as a daughter, right? Not just as the mother and a wife and work, but when it became very important to me, necessity to me, my role as a daughter to me it was not negotiable, right? And. I don't know how I did it, but again, I have a very supportive family. Again, I, uh, you know, was found a way. I had I found a way to uh, make sure that I took care of, you know, uh, everything that needed to be taken care of, you know, and things like that. So anyway, I, I'm I'm throwing that in as an example uh, to say that 
life is not easy, but again, it's rewarding, right? So, if, and if you think about what, if you didn't do that, I, I wouldn't want to be that way either. You know, so uh, I, it's, it's hard. I remember uh, after the helicopter uh, flight demonstration, one of these flights that uh, you saw, it was a big uh, success and all of us got to take some a little time off for the first time. And we went out of time uh, with my husband and my children and I'm walking along and I'm like, when did I become the shortest person in the family? You know, so those are the kinds of things I missed out, right? Because I really missed out a lot of time, you know, but emotionally I didn't miss a beat because I knew where they were, you know, in school or friends, socially, you know, so anyway, it's keep at it, don't give up. And you don't want to give it all up either. It's really fun, right? So it's, it's a balance. And we're very sorry to hear about your mom. Uh, I actually grew up hearing about your mother. You know, my my mother uh, and her siblings call her Mama La. And uh, so I always felt that I knew her, but of course I don't think we ever, maybe we met when I was I, I was young, but yeah, sorry about that. And and I think it just shows that life and work, it's all, it's all interrelated, right? And as you say, it's yeah. about finding the right balance and you don't have to do it all. Um, I think it's impossible to, to do everything, you know, uh, well at the same time. But uh, as long as you're doing the important oh. thing at, at when it, when the time comes, that's that's probably what matters. Right. And one important tip, for example, another good tip I have from another woman manager is, for example, when you're having kids, around the time you're having kids, you're really, you know, stressed, right? Because you're really physically taking care of kids. Then maybe you want to you know, be in a, a, a deputy position or something like that, you know, take something, still keep a go on a career track, because, you know, for me, a career is just something I enjoy. So I want to be on the track. But the advice I heard from another woman manager is she actually took some deputy position so that she's still on a management track, but take it a little bit slower. And then once the kids grow up a little bit, then you pick up again. Yes. So Definitely look out for the flow, you know, the app and the flow and, uh, but be mindful, be very mindful. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I started uh, my career in finance. I was an investment banker. It was very, very, you know, driven organization. Uh, everybody uh, is so focused about work. And one of the things that I, I reflect back on and also tell, you know, younger, uh, younger people, especially younger women is, you know, career is a long, long thing, you know, it's okay to, to sort of uh, take it slowly at some points, and then you can accelerate again. Don't think that if you didn't, you know, didn't get promoted every two years, three years, like you're supposed to, that you've completely, you know, lost your career. No, it's, it's okay. And these days, you know, it's so unpredictable. I don't know how you feel with your children, but with my, with my boys, I feel like I don't know what I'm preparing them for. So I'm just going to equip them to be good human beings, have that grit, you know, have that ability to think and navigate life for themselves, because I have no idea what kind of profession I'm preparing them for. I mean, uh, it's up to them. It's not up to me on what they do. Uh, but I can't even guide, you know, I can't even say, hey, go become a NASA scientist, because that's cool, because I don't know. Um, I'm definitely not going to say go become an investment banker, because that's uncool now. <laughs> so it's just, it, you just don't know, you know, what um, the world is changing so quickly that 10 years from now, 20 years from now, when they are in their careers, I will have no idea uh, what is going to be working. Uh, so as a parent, I, I do think that, you know, it's hard work, grit, thinking uh, that and that passion maybe to to do things that I can try to instill in my children. Sure. And the other advice, is, again, don't underestimate. You can do it. If you really believe you're attracted to the field and you can do it, you can do it. I think that would be what we can offer our children is the confidence because I really believe it. I'm not just saying that it isn't like you have to be this special, extremely smart or extreme. You, you don't, there is no extraordinary person, you know, like that. It really is about what you really like to do and what you're good in. And then having that confidence to say, I know I can do it and having that grit and, and, and not giving up. And that's what stops us from giving up, right? I mean, that's what you're sharing. You're, you're sharing in your career too. That's what stops us from giving up is that confidence. So I think what we can give our children is if you are really honestly finding a feel and you honestly truly believe you can do it, have the confidence to do it and don't let anybody talk you out of it. Not even yourself, you know, let alone other people. 
Um, changing tack a little bit, you know, there are a lot of questions coming in about the, the Myanmar education system, especially the university system. And perhaps it's slightly unfair for, for us to be asking you that question, because even though you are Myanmar, you, you've been spending uh, the bulk of your life outside of the country. But you know, there, there, there are questions about how we can improve our university systems. It, it, it is quite heartbreaking. You know, the universities that your parents graduated from have, have have decayed uh, and we're just now trying to rejuvenate them. There are a lot of, um, I, I, I really am impressed. I've been back home now in Myanmar for the last seven years and I'm really impressed with the younger generation. You know, there, there's thirst, to, so much thirst to learn. Uh, they're hardworking and, but the system hasn't, hasn't caught back up yet. So um, there are questions about, you know, what you think we should be doing to, to improve our education systems. And if you don't think that you can answer that directly, you know, please feel free to maybe just make um, other comments that could be helpful for young people trying to get a good education. Sure. Yeah. I probably can't comment on the system. Again, I have, yeah, I don't have familiarity, um, but, in terms of the younger uh, generation, um, again, this is me, this is my bias. Um, as you're learning, right, in school, it's important to understand the fundamentals, okay? So whether it's, we're talking now STEM, right? Science, technology, engineering, mathematics, uh, kind of field that I've been in. Um, understand the fundamentals, whether it's math, physics or you know mechanical i think it's important to understand the foundation the basics of it and whenever you're learning something make sure you understand how it works and it will pay off many 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 times over as you progress in further education and in your work and so that would be the main thing you know to to um not jump you you can go jump into building larger system, but don't always understand the building blocks. Understand the basics uh, uh, first, and um, and then I mean, right now there is uh, so much uh, out there. You you actually have so much more than um, I did, you know, as a, as a child, right? As, as I mean, when I was again, uh, you know. Uh, uh, elementary school, but middle school, but even in high school, uh, in in the back in uh, the U.S. or in college, I mean, we had so much less actually um, uh, because of the with the internet, right? There, there are there is so much knowledge out there. Uh, it's incredible. In fact, uh, you can look up so many things uh, that I, I I think you have a lot that you can pursue. So I guess my advice is. Um, understand really how things work and then use those building blocks to build on it and i you'll be surprised i don't think you're as limited as you may be thinking yeah there is just so much that i i was craving for things you know uh when i was uh younger that uh you know and, and it's never too late you know what i mean so yeah you can start today and there is there is a lot so uh, but i i do caution understand how things work and then build on top of it well, thank you very much for saying that. You know, in the old days, you hear stories about people who p teach themselves things out of libraries, right? Uh, reading books in libraries. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and now, you know, it's at the touch of your 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 finger yes. or a keyboard because there's so much out there. And and I I really again want to thank you for mentioning that because one of the reasons, actually, primary reason that we do this TEDx Yangon is because uh, of education, and it's also because you know education knowledge is so freely available now on the internet so we wanted to draw people to not the not just the ted talks or the tedx talks that we put on but you know just to say go please you know think of things please go and learn and study it's just so much information it is incredible right i i grew up still grew up in generation where you had to go and you know even in university and you know, i went to university in the us wonderful university you have to go into the library you know go yeah. and look at index <laughs> cards 
you have to go read books in order to get you know a few facts about something that you're writing on now you know you can just sit there you know wikipedia is there you know there's youtube education you know khan academy for younger kids you know nasa yeah. puts out all sorts of things so all all of you who ask questions about the the technicalities of the the mars helicopter they're actually on on uh the the pages in nasa please go and have a look you know i i i think it's, it's incredible my, my elder one is only 10 and the things that he knows you know just and i go how do you know this well, like, well mommy you know there's this youtube channel that talks about this you know there's this uh, particular um uh, kid block that is discussing that you know he's actually really into space so he would love this uh uh, this talk um, and it's just incredible and uh, I just feel that it's up to you really up to us to to yeah. keep learning and also the older people uh, not that I consider myself <laughs> old but uh, for, to also keep learning um, and as you say get the fundamentals right and build on that so thank you so much for that and mommy me uh, it's been so incredible, you know, spending the last hour and a bit with you. It has the, the you know, it's, uh, I'm very conscious of taking up your time uh, on a Saturday evening and also uh, want to be conscious of the fact that people have been listening. We have over 2,000 people uh, live online oh, with wow. us right now. Uh, so, and wow. who've, who've been uh, been following this since uh, since we started uh, an hour and a bit ago. So I want to thank all of those people as well. But before I um, conclude, uh, Mamimi, can I just hand it back over to you for any kind of last thoughts, either on yourself, the uh, project itself, you know, this conversation, anything that you want to impart to um, young people, especially that you know you haven't uh, you haven't already covered. Yeah, Jeff. Thank you, first of all. Jesus de Mare to say. Jesus um, Yeah, I thank you really for this opportunity to share. It's very meaningful. I've been, you know, very excited about tonight. Um, I just want to summarize. I really want everybody listening to really have the confidence. I really when I was young, I thought you had to be really smart or you had to be really special or you had to have some gift or something. And it isn't true, you know, really, each of us have something and you really need to, you, all you have to do is believe in yourself. And I think, um, you know, Mathiri and I are talking about here about how much knowledge there is out there. You have so much out there that we didn't have. Um, and so you should really go for it. I think the confidence and not letting yourself talk you out of it and anybody else talk you out of it, find what you like to do, find what you're good at, and find using that intersection with what project or community organization, what do you want to make happen? It's not easy, you won't find it right away, but really look for that intersection and then work really hard expect bumps, expect nothing is easy. There is nobody that was so brilliant that life was so easy for them. I thought that's how life worked. No, <laughs> everything is hard. If we, even a simple project looks simple, it's really hard. A hard project is hard too. Um, and just go after it. You have all that knowledge and enjoy, enjoy. And and I, I like what Mathiri said, which is life is, it's a big balance. So yes, you know, balance life and work is a long journey, but you will have fun if you're brutally honest with yourself and say, this is what I like to do. This is what I'm good at. And this is what I want to make happen. And uh, just have confidence. And I wish somebody had told me when I was younger. So anyway, I'm saying it back now. <laughs> so yeah, don't, don't underestimate, don't underestimate yourself. And it is all at the end of the day, it is about hard work. Once you know that you have that focus, it's about the hard work, but don't, don't think there are any shortcuts. Like my mother told me there are no shortcuts. <laughs> so yeah. And I think that's a brilliant note to end on. And Mamimi, thank you again so much for all your wisdom, all the experiences that you've shared. And I think it just resonates across the board, you know, whether somebody's interested in science or not, there's just a lot of pearls of wisdom on life itself that you've shared with us. And for that, I'm, I'm really, really grateful. So thank you very much again. 
Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm very grateful. Thank you. I'd also like to thank uh, once again the American Center uh, in Yangon and Jefferson Center in Mandalay and all those tuning in from there and the U.S. Embassy for supporting us on that, the Salween Group, and also, of course, my wonderful TEDx Yangon team who's done this for the last uh, few months uh, on Sundays and all the preparation that we go into it. And again, thank you, all of you, for listening in and spending your Sunday morning with us. Um, like I said in the beginning, we will be taking a little break from our conversation series. We have run it for um, six months now. There are, including today's talk uh, with Mami Miao, we have seven talks that are on Facebook as well as our YouTube page that you can go back and listen to if you missed uh, if you miss them or you're just coming to this for the first time. And we will resume again uh, in uh, in a few months time. And um, please follow and like us on our TEDx Yangon Facebook page to get notifications for that. Um, TEDx Yangon 2021, we hope will happen, but we have decided that we want to do that in person when it is safe to do so. Uh, given the COVID situation. So watch out for that as well, but we will be doing a speaker call out for that so that we can start preparing. Uh, it takes about five to six months for uh, us to prepare speakers for the stage. So we will be doing that relatively shortly. And um, as ever, uh, please uh, keep pursuing knowledge. And if we can help uh, you as TEDx Yangon to do that, we will be doing it. So please follow our pages and see you again. Have a good Sunday and Saturday evening to those of you in North America. Bye-bye.